Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. This is an important time for our nation and our city. Each week until November 4th, we will address the concerns of New Yorkers and Americans and how the nominees for president and vice president are addressing them. We'll try to assess this extraordinary period with news and government observers and the newsmakers themselves. If State Senator Liz Kruger's district were not in New York City, it might be a microcosm of the entire country. It stretches from 19th Street to 103rd Street, from the East River to 8th Avenue, and includes Times Square, the Upper East Side, Central Park, and the American Museum of Natural History. The senator is committed to the election of the Barack Obama, Joseph Biden ticket. Welcome. Thank you. The boundaries of District 26 are so interesting. I was going to say bizarre, but <laughs> who drew them up this like this and, and why? Well, when I first ran for the state Senate in 2000, my district was the east side not Midtown or Central Park or the Museum of Natural History, but also included uh, Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village, and Waterside. I did so well in those sections of my district in that election, which I did not win, um, but by 0.0001%, that when the redistricting took place for 2002's election, the Republicans controlled the state Senate and controlled the redistricting of the Senate lines. Basically, it was an attempt to gerrymander um, about 13,000 of my voters away from me in the hopes that that would then strengthen the Republican opponent. Mm -hmm. chances. Um, happily, from my perspective, even with the gerrymandered change in district lines, I ended up winning the November 2002 election 60-40, and in fact ended up with a fabulous section of Manhattan that people didn't ever think of as really being residential, Midtown and the Theater District and Times Square, that of course has seen an enormous growth both in residential construction and business construction just in the last six years. Tell me about the demographics of the district in terms of race, age, income levels, political leanings, first-generation Americans, immigrants. Well, my district, because it has the United Nations and all of the consulates. You've got the United Nations, too? I've my got goodness. the UN, too. Wow. So I've got an incredibly international district as far as, the, as people living here, although the UN world isn't necessarily voting here. By definition, it's not. So we are a microcosm for the world, because you have the whole world not only living in my district, but actually then coming into work in my district every day. Millions of people come through my district every day. Even even though technically it's got the same approximate 320,000 people that each state senate district would have. But how about income? Okay, and my district is considered one of the higher income districts in the state. I think I compete with just one other Westchester district for probably being the wealthiest district. At the same time, we also have pockets of poverty. I have a disproportionately large number of senior citizens in my district who have been living here their whole lives and have been attempting to age in place in their homes. I have a significant number of rent-regulated and rent-controlled um, apartments, as well as a huge percentage of condominium owners. And of course, the economic changes of the last few weeks will have a disproportionate impact on my district, both from the perspective of people who live in Manhattan, working in the financial and insurance and real estate businesses, and the impact on commercial and residential real estate. Right so you here. are basically the state senator who represents the the east side, essentially. Right, the east side and midtown. Right, I mean, it's a, right. It's, people always, everyone claims they have the best district in the world. Right. I actually do have the de okay, best district okay. in the world. It was I was looking at the racial demographics. It's, it's got to be one of the whitest districts um, in the yes, city. Yes, it you is. Know, it's like 82 percent non-Hispanic white. That's pretty white. Right. It's got a Latino community and an Asian community, although also small, but a very small African-American um, population. And for me, as a, when I've been a candidate, one of the interesting things for me in my district is the African-American population in my district is Republican. Really? I have a significant number of black Republicans mm -hmm. um, who have, you know, again, done well and can afford to live in my district. Right. And their politics, to some degree, reflect their uh, socioeconomic background more than what people assume is some stereotyped race association right. with a party. Right. What would you say are 
the most pressing concerns of the citizens in your district right now? I know that's a big question. It is a huge question. My district is incredibly well educated. I suppose that's another demographic of my district. Not only does everyone have a college degree, a huge percentage have advanced degrees beyond college. So it's a very reading district. It's people who get up in the morning and read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal before they do anything else and think, I think, about global issues national issues and then state issues. So right now my district is very focused on what is the impact of the economic meltdown, um, not only on their own lives but on our state and our country. Um, then people are also very focused on exactly the same issues as you would find anywhere in the world. Are the schools good for their kids? Do their children have some place to go out and play? Um, are there safe streets and safe neighborhoods? Do, the, do we have a mass transit infrastructure that will assure they can get from their homes to their work, that we have a city that they would want to continue to live in and raise their families in? For senior citizens, it's concerns about can they afford their prescription drugs and their rent? What's happening with energy costs? Perhaps one thing that's a bit different about my district, um, people aren't as fixated on the price of gas for their cars. And technically, I only have one gas station in my district. Really? Now, why is that? Uh, the cost of real estate is just way too high for a gas station to make it, so there's one left. And no, most but I mean, people, why are they not concerned about the prices of gas? Oh, because prices. most people are moving around the city um, with mass transit. Okay. All right, they're not getting in their cars to drive to work in the morning. Okay, okay. Or maybe they have their, uh, um, their cars are parked out at the houses in the Hamptons or wherever, you know. Uh, yeah, I know. And I certainly have a, a number of residents and probably more than most who do have second homes somewhere mm -hmm. and have been able to afford them, mm -hmm. although right now they're talking about putting them on the market, right? And what does it mean to not be able to afford the second home? Mm -hmm. um, although I have to say most of the focus for my office would be people who can't, who aren't sure they can afford to stay in the one home they have. Interesting. Even in the wealthiest district right. in New York. But the schools are pretty good over there. Schools are great, but complete, completely overcrowded um, because people, you know, the good news is people want to live in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is there's been massive growth, which, you know, most people think of as good for the, for the economy and good for the city, but we keep putting up all these giant new residential towers as if that didn't mean we'd have more children and therefore we'd need to plan for more schools. Right. So we have not kept pace with the growth of families with our school classrooms. Are they talking size. about building any more schools well, in your district? Um, we have a couple that have gone up or are in the process of going up, but they are still way behind the timeline for the number of children who have been born um, and or families moving into the district. So we are several thousand seats behind where we need to be right now in the public school system. I think just about everybody and including, you know, the residents of your district are concerned about what's happening with the economy. Um, what are your feelings about the proposed federal bailout uh, that got defeated in the House of Representatives this week? Well, I was fairly shocked to see the House vote down the bailout bill. And having said that, I don't pretend I understand all the details of the bill. I'm actually having trouble finding anyone who does understand all the details of the bill. And I do think that more effort could have been put in to protect consumers and homeowners at risk of losing their homes in the bill. But having said that, I was amazed that the House didn't pass the bill. Um, we need to. We need to pass something to help reassure the entire world market system um, that we're not in collapse. So what was that about? What was that vote about? Well, when you look at the numbers, all right, you had Democrats who voted against it, I think, and I respect in principle that they didn't like the idea of a bailout. You had Republicans who voted against it because they were mad at the Speaker of the House for criticizing President Bush on the floor. We're, we're a partisan country, politics is partisan, and everybody beats up on each other all the time. That's a fact of our lives, you know, the line about watching the sausages get made. It's mm -hmm. not very pretty. But for anyone to have voted against the bill because they were miffed about what somebody said on the floor, under that theory, no one should ever vote for any bill on the floor of any legislature, because somebody always gets up and says something that can be interpreted as insulting. So I was shocked that that was the position taken by a significant number of the Republican congressional representatives, that they voted against the bill, not because they didn't see the necessity of the bill, but because they were miffed 
at things that were said. Um, I'm hoping that the U.S. Senate is going to go back tonight and vote for this bill and that the House will vote for it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Apparently some changes have been made. Um, again, I can pretty much tell you if I was to have been briefed on every piece of the bill that I would have problems. But if I was in Congress, I know I would be voting for it despite those problems. Right. Uh, because again, everybody is at risk and everyone's being harmed by what's going on right now. How do you feel about John McCain's and Barack Obama's um, behavior concerning the bailout? Well, I thought, Mr. Look, obviously, I am a supporter of Barack Obama, so I have a partisan bias here. But the concept that John McCain said he was stopping his campaign because he had to get to Washington and to fix save this, the country, right. save the country, <laughs> one, when you're the president of the United States, you have to do more than one thing at once, always. Two, he wasn't on the relevant committees. Therefore, the argument that he had to be rushed back to Washington was not apparent to me. Three, having rushed back, but then having continued his campaign, he announced several times that he had brokered the deal and the bill was done, except the bill didn't go through. Right, right. So that seems that he has a lot of explaining to do. Um, Senator Obama, I understand, had focused more specifically on a number of items within the bill while supporting the effort. And I believe that a number of the recommendations he made are in fact included in the amended version that the Senate's gonna pass today. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back after this message. Whatever we deny or embrace for us or for better, we belong, we belong, we belong, we belong together. Underneath everything we are, underneath everything we do, we are all people, connected, interdependent, united. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with State Senator Liz Kruger. There's been a lot of talk about who won the first presidential debate and how the candidates are doing, you know, following uh, pretty successful conventions by both of them. How do you think you're, you're an unabashed Barack Obama supporter? How do you think he's doing now? Um, I think every time the public has a chance to see Barack Obama next to John McCain, Barack Obama's winning more voters. And I absolutely think that was the case with the debate the other night. Um, I think the first 40 minutes of the debate, which were on the economy, um, clearly showed why Senator Obama has a far greater understanding not only of the economic times we face, but what he would actually do about it if he was in the White House. I thought that Senator McCain seemed to be flailing when it came to questions of the economy. When they shifted to foreign policy, I actually gave Senator McCain higher points than I expected I would mm -hmm. for how he handled himself. But when I woke up the next morning and read the poll results of independents around the country, I determined yet again I didn't quite understand how the American public makes their own judgment calls. Because while I thought McCain did fairly well on the foreign policy side of the debate, the polls of independence in this country, and let's face it, November 4th right now is all about the independence in purple states, um, that they clearly thought that McCain was out of touch and far preferred Barack Obama. So even if I didn't read the second half of the debate that way, I was delighted to see that the public and the public in the states where we really have to be concerned did see that Barack Obama was much stronger in their camp on foreign policy issues than Senator McCain. Has Joe Biden turned out to be as dynamic as a lot of people, as some people expected him to be? I think the parameters change when McCain picks Sarah Palin, because one of the perceptions about Joe Biden not only was that he is an unbelievably smart and articulate man who has a huge amount of foreign policy experience, but that also he has a, a biting wit and that if Barack Obama is not known necessarily to go for the jugular in his approach to political debate, that that was going to be partly Joe Biden's role. Right. And I think when Sarah Palin was chosen, um, it did change the dynamics of the entire presidential race in any number of ways, one of which was the concern 
that Senator Biden not be seen as being too aggressively on the attack mode for Sarah Palin as the vice president. So I think that has changed the dynamic, but we've got that debate coming up, so I'm looking forward to watching that one. That's going to be pretty interesting, I yeah. think. One of the issues that everybody has been talking about for the last few years is the need for universal health coverage. Um, yet now we've got this, you know, this recession, depression, whatever it is. What effect do you think the economic downturn and the possible expenses of a federal bailout are going to have on the possibility of our getting health insurance for everybody? I actually think it strengthens really? the opportunity to do so. Um, one of the things that I think we all need to go back and spend a little time on is the history of the United States and what happened in other economic crises. And out of the Depression came FDR's New Deal. And what was the New Deal? It was recognizing that government had an important role to play in regulation, and the government had an important role to play in the economy and in programs to protect Americans. And while I am miserable over the fact that we are in bad economic times, and I fear we're going to go into worse economic times before it's better, I see that also as an important time to look at history and say, why did we have a New Deal after the Depression to help pull us up and out and strengthen our economy and the future of our country? And most people would agree that's what the New Deal did. And so I see universal health care as one of the great opportunities for the federal government due to bad economic times to turn around those policies. We've tried pretty much everything else in health care policy, and none of that's working. So it is time for this country, which is now decades behind several other Western nations, um, to move into a universal health care program. It will help create jobs. It can be a program that strengthens the economy and expands opportunities. It also shifts the dynamic of having insurance based on whether or not you have a job and whether or not you can move from that job because of your fears of losing health insurance. We need more flexibility and more creativity for 21st century model of economy and jobs and shifting from a employment-driven model of health insurance to a universal model I think is a perfect step forward right now. If you walk around New York City these days, you see all kinds of co-ops and condos and commercial buildings going, I mean, everywhere, um, and two new stadiums being built, and yet the city's transportation system, aside from the, you know, we are, they are digging for the Second Avenue subway finally, uh, yet the transportation system does not seem to be expanding to meet the needs. Do you see that happening, and exactly how might that happen? Well, again, that's a second part of lessons of history that I think are valuable for us to revisit right now. What was the other thing that this country did during the Great Depression of, of 1929 through the 30s? We invested in through highways, the WPA right. in infrastructure. Right, right. We said we need to put our people to work, and we have plenty of work to be done. That's where we are right now. We have plenty of work to be done. And we have people who need jobs. I do think that this is the right time to be talking about shifting to a WPA model of supporting and building infrastructure. And I think that's what you're supposed to do as government in bad economic times. So yes, the Second Avenue subway, there's a huge hole in the ground. The Second Avenue subway, there's a huge hole in the ground up at 92nd and 2nd. Um, there is discussion about stopping or slowing down that process. I hope we move forward. I am actually not a big supporter of government funds for stadiums, and so I think that we would have better spent our money on any number of other infrastructure efforts instead of sports stadiums, including building more schools in our overcrowded system. Um, I do believe that we, w we are seeing already a slowdown in private construction. In fact, the New York Times is filled with stories about inability to get the capital, to get the bonds, to continue with private building, vacancy rates growing in commercial office space throughout the city of New York. Okay, it's time to switch gears and use that construction system we have um, to do infrastructure that the public needs and will strengthen our opportunity to grow again when we get past this economic downturn. Before he was forced out in a sex scandal, uh, Governor Elliot Spitzer 
had vowed to come to Albany and break up the gridlock there, you know, the backroom wheeling and dealing that seemed to control everything that came out of the state legislature. Well, Spitzer's gone and Bruno's gone, but has anything changed in the way Albany does business? Yeah, I think Albany is slowly getting dragged into the 21st century from the 19th century. I personally think we skipped the 20th century, um, but that there have been some changes in the six and a half years that I have been there, and that we are on the cusp of an opportunity to radically change how the legislature operates. The Democrats have not been in the majority in the New York State Senate um, in any of our lifetimes. We are one seat away from a tie, two to taking the majority. I believe the Democrats will be the majority when we go back in January, which will change the dynamic of how both houses operate. Because for decades and decades and decades, each house has been able to point fingers at the other and say, well, it's your party's fault, it's your party's fault. That will not be an excuse anymore. We will have a Democratic governor, David Patterson, the democratically controlled assembly and a democratically controlled Senate. We will have to act like grown-ups and get the work of the people done because we will no longer be able to fall back on partisan bickering, which has been the excuse for any number of things we haven't done, mm -hmm. again, for decades. Now, bad economic times, it's not going to be walking in there as the majority party going, we get to do everything everyone wanted because, unfortunately, we're not going to have any money, as each day's revenue project projections show us. But it will give us an opportunity, I believe, to come forward with creative, progressive agendas for the state of New York that are going to set us off into a much better 21st century than I saw Albany operating on in the several decades that I have been an observer or a participant there. Following that, and I ask you about what, what are some of the, the main issue, main concerns of your constituents on, on the east side, but what do you see as some of the most pressing issues facing the state? Well, number one right now for the state is that our revenue projections are that we can't afford the budget that we have in place for this year, nor the budgets we hope to have in place for the next several years. So I think one of the number one issues for any legislator in Albany is what are our priorities and how are we going to stay focused on protecting the priority issues of state government and stopping any number of the ways we've been spending money um, that are either second priority, third priority, or frankly, we never should have spent the money anyway. I am very interested personally in evaluating our entire tax policy structure. It is the 21st century, and we have a model of tax policy that was built on an agrarian state. We're not an agrarian state anymore. And we have a very regressive tax system, which means that people who are lower income and working and middle income are paying a higher percentage of their income to taxes than other New Yorkers. We need a fair and equitable tax system. I think that's one of the problems with the bailout issue in Washington. There's a perception that that bill is for wealthy Americans, when in fact, I think the not yet explained assignment is that, in fact, everyone is being harmed by our not doing something to fix the economic crisis we're in. And again, when people don't think we have a fair tax policy system, they're not really interested in why your justification for spending over here is better than over there, because they're still saying, explain to me why we're paying the taxes we are, and explain to me why what we're paying is fair compared to our neighbors. Right. We've got a couple minutes left. Um, I'd be interested in, in hearing from you what has pleased you most about the presidential election and what has, uh, the campaign, and what has disappointed you most about it. Hmm. What have pleased me most, I think, is about sort of the growing power of the public to participate in ways that they couldn't in the past. The Internet is a, is a fascinating and complex um, new world of communication. So we're seeing, I think, the good news, younger people, are in a, younger people and a broader audience of people getting involved in the political process and getting involved in organizing in ways you never could before. Um, unlike Sarah Palin, I'm a big believer in community organizing, and I think the Internet is a new model for mm -hmm. that in presidential and local politics. What I'm concerned about is that, again, everybody gets caught up in their 30-second sound bites rather than having substantive, um, difficult debates over very tough policy issues. Most things in the 21st century really can't be 
discussed or fixed in a 30-second soundbite, but I do think our model of, of media and TV coverage forces candidates from both sides of the aisle to try to spin mm -hmm. everything very, very quickly, rather than saying, this is a tough issue. It'll take me more than 30 sec seconds to explain it. So I wish there was more opportunity for the public to hear from all the candidates in truly substantive, longer dialogue right. what the tough issues facing this country are. Well, our last 30 seconds are up. And I want to thank State Senator Liz Kruger for joining us. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.